So where we're going to be today is in Ephesians. In Ephesians. Um, Paul wrote to Ephesians to the people of Ephesus. Um, this letter we have is 61 to 62 AD while he was in Rome. And prior to this, Paul had spent two years with the Ephesian people. Um, in Acts 19, you can read that account of the time Paul spent with the Ephesians. Um, while Paul was there, God was at work doing great things. <clears throat> See, Ephesus was the capital of Asia Minor, and it was a political place of where people came, they met, they, they spent time there <coughs> because there was a temple there for a false god, uh, Arti Artemius. I hope I'm saying that right. But, so, Ephesus was, a, was the chief city in the province. It was an important city. There was a lot of money there, a lot of wealth. Um, but God was working through Paul when he went there. He, he was preaching the gospel. Um, eyes were being opened. In fact, so many eyes were being opened to the truth that the believers, they come together and they took their past they took their past that was their magic books, their, their things of the past that, that meant something to them, things that they went and spent money on, and they piled them up in a pile, and they burned it. And it was a lot of money worth of books that they burned. The Bible says 50,000 pieces of silver worth. And... So God was working strong there. He was working in the people of Ephesus. And Demetrius, this silversmith, comes along, and he can see that it is hurting his financial gain. gain. So he gets a riot together. He, gets, he goes to all the other people like him, and he says, hey, this guy Paul, he's ruining things. He's messing things up. We've got... He's taking money out of our pockets. So this big riot happens right towards the end of the time that Paul's there. And <clears throat> it, anyways, he leaves, the, he leaves later on. And you can read about that, like I said, in Acts 19. I, I suggest you do. Because if you guys aren't reading your Bibles every day, you need to be. But, um, so we can see that Paul was working there. I mean, that God was working there through Paul. And then Paul writes a letter to the Ephesians. And that's what we're going to be studying in today. And we're going to study in, uh, we're going to start in Ephesians 4.17, the new life. And I'll just read that to you. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to the hardness of their hearts, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him. As the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through the deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, <clears throat> sorry, in true righteousness and holiness. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, Paul is telling the saints, no longer walk as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their minds or in the vanity of their minds. Um, this old self, 
this old self, see, that the, the, the Ephesians were struggling with. This old self that they're packing along with them. The, the old self that we all have is if we're believers in God, if we're believers in Jesus. We have this old self that is still with us. And Paul understands this. He knows the struggle of, of a dark heart, of, of the inside of that of that old dead man that we pack along with us. He understands this, and we see Paul talk about it in uh, Romans 7.15. He says, because Paul struggled with this too. He's not, Paul's not asking the Ephesians to do anything that he's not, that he's not doing also. He's saying, he's telling the Ephesians, don't walk like that anymore. Don't be a part of that anymore. Don't live in your sin anymore. You, you've been bought. You've been bought by the blood of Jesus. So, in Romans 7.15, Paul is writing, and this kind of gives us a glimpse into what Paul, because he understands. Paul understands, and he says, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not, for I do, not do what I want, but do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that no, that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Paul understands the power of the flesh and what it can have on the believers. So he tells the saints in Ephesus, don't walk in as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Don't do it anymore. He understands this. He knows this. And he knows that they are now saints. We see this. See, because the book of Ephesians was written to the saints. Um, right in chapter, in 1-1, one, one, the second half of 1-1, one, one, to the saints who are in Ephesus, and are faithful in Christ Jesus. He's writing to the saints. So he's talking to the saints, and he's saying, don't do this anymore. Don't, don't follow in your path of your old selves. That they are darkened in their understanding and alienated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. That's what he continues on and says. Don't walk in it. <coughs> We're with Jesus, if we're following Jesus, we can't walk in it. We can't walk in this darkness anymore. We can't be a part of our old life. It's what Paul is struggling with. He says, I keep doing these things I don't want to do. I keep, I want to follow the Spirit. I want to follow life. But I keep following, I keep following the things that are going to hurt me that are going to hurt me spiritually, that, that may hurt me physically. That's what we all struggle with. We all struggle with this flesh. This flesh that we're packing along with us. Um, the Pilgrim's Progress is a perfect example of that. that. I don't know if any of you guys have read that, but he's got the, the bundle on his back of burden. But then he gets rid of it, but he still has. He still has struggles too. But anyways... Um, these Ephesians are now saints. And if we follow Jesus, we cannot go back to the darkness. If we just jump over to 5.5, 5, I want to read something to you. Um, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexual immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time, you were darkness. So not only were we, they are darkened in their understanding, not only were we in the darkness and darkened by it, but we are darkness. 
Before we come to know the Lord, we are darkness. That's what he says. For at one time, you were dark, darkness. I love the word but in Paul's writings. Because you have, he lays it out, he lays it out. This is what you are. You're, you're a wretch. And you have no hope because this and this and this. is. And then he says, but. And that's what he says here. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So Paul's writing to him, and he says, You need to quit following the flesh. He's telling him they need to mortify their sin. Mortify. I used to read that word and I was like, what does mortify mean? And so, um, I, I looked it up in the Merriam-Webster Merriam Dictionary and this is what mortify says. To destroy the strength, vitality, or functioning of. Or to subdue or deaden the body or the bodily appetites. Let's be honest, that's what causes us to sin. We want that. We have that appetite in us that we want to do what we're not supposed to do. That's what Paul was, was struggling with. Covetousness, he talks about. He, he wouldn't have even known what covetousness was if it wasn't for the law. But, but now he does the thing he doesn't want to do. He sees that, what somebody else has, and he, he comes. He... he it's the appetite of our flesh, so we need to mortify that. How do we mortify it? Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. Paul says in 420, this is not the way you learned Christ. Back in 420, he says, this is not the way you learned Christ. Paul had spent two years with the Ephesians, preached Jesus Christ and Him crucified continually. We know that he did this because that's what he does in the other books. And Paul, Paul doesn't really talk about that in Ephesians. I mean, in in uh, in uh, sorry in I lost my train. Acts. He doesn't really talk about Acts about him preaching the gospel and Jesus Christ crucified, but he does in the other books. We know that Paul does preach the cross and him crucified. If we look at uh, Colossians, that's what he, he claims, not Colossians, but uh, 1 Corinthians, that's what he claims. He says, I claim to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. So we know that that's what he does. That's what he did with the Ephesians. He had preached Jesus Christ and him crucified and now they're, new they're a new creation. If we look at 1.13 in Ephesians, it says, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire, the, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. So, they're a new creation. People that, God, that Paul is writing to in Ephesians are a new creation. They've been sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit when they believed. The, the Ephesians, they were dead. Just like we were all dead. We've all, we've all been spiritually dead. Not one of us have, has been, that has been born, that is a descendant of Adam and Eve have been born spiritually alive. 
we have all been born spiritually dead. We can see this in, in chapter 2 of Ephesians. And you were dead. Think about that for a second. You were dead. And you were dead. You were spiritually dead. What can I do about that? What can I do about that to my, for myself? You were spiritually dead. I can't do anything about that. I'm dead. I'm spiritually dead. Because of my trespasses and sins, I'm spiritually dead. There has to be an outside force that comes in. Just like Lazarus when he died and Jesus came four days later. Lazarus could not raise himself up from the dead. He had to, Jesus, what, did, what happened? Jesus had to call out to him and say, Lazarus, come out. An outside force through the Spirit of God had to raise Lazarus from the dead. In the same way, we're spiritually dead. And an outside force has to come in and raise us. Let's continue. In which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. So, not only are we dead, but we're following the prince of the power of these, and the prince of the power of air. So we're following Satan. So we're dead, and we're following Satan. So if you're out here right now, and you're thinking, I'm my own person. I'm not a slave to anybody. That's a lie. Because we have two options. We can either be a slave to Jesus Christ, who is a good taskmaster, who loves us, who died for us, or we can be slaves to a horrible taskmaster who wants to see us dead, who wants us to, to destroy us, who, who keeps us in our sin, who keeps us in our spiritual deadness. And until that force comes in, that's where we are. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. So all of us, we all were there. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were natures and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So spiritually dead, no hope. Then we have that other word, that other word that is beautiful that Paul always uses, but, but God. So even though I'm spiritually dead and I have no hope because I can't yell at myself, Ben, come out. I can't. There's, there's no hope there. But when the Spirit comes and moves in me, because someone preached the gospel to me, someone has to go. That's the way God set it up. Someone goes, someone preaches the gospel. The Spirit opens my heart. I see it, and I come out. And I follow the Lord. So now I'm... But God. But God, being rich in mercy. Being rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show his immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God and not a result of works set, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We need to recognize God's mercy to us. Paul's aim with the Ephesians was that they recognize God's mercy and not fall back into that deadness. So, when this has happened in us, so when we've 
come to know the Lord. When that outside force of the Spirit has come in and someone has preached the gospel to me and I have accepted the Lord, then do we just go on living and just do what we want? No. That is when the battle begins inside of us. That's why Paul so many times over and over again tells us about, tells the Ephesians about how they need the Lord. They need, they were dead in their trespasses. They were this, they were that. Because we need to stay fighting the battle of sin. We need to fight, we need to, we need to mortify the sin. We need to put it to death. We need to kill it. Because <coughs> there's no rest. God doesn't want us to rest. Jesus doesn't want us to rest. He wants us to keep fighting the good fight. I want to be clear with one thing before I move on. I want to be clear, we can't lose our salvation. If, we're, if, if, we've been, if we've been made alive by the Spirit of God, we cannot lose that. Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are, on, who are in Christ Jesus. When we are in Christ Jesus, we cannot lose that. It's there. We've been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. We're going to meet the Lord face to face. And he's going to be proud of us, us wretched sinners, because we, not because of our works, because we followed him, because we chose to follow him. He is going to be proud of us. Well done, good and faithful servant. You chose me. You followed me. Instead of staying down your path of death and hell. Paul, in his hopelessness, back in Romans 7.15, when he's talking about he's talking about the sin that is in him and the fight that he has, the battle that he has, you can just, you can feel the anguish in his heart <coughs> and, his, and his building and he's like, I just keep doing the things I don't want to do. I mean, that I keep doing the things yeah, that I don't want to do and keep, it's just the anguish is building and he says, and it, and it comes out in verse 24 wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord see, we need to be there we need to be, we need to be fighting that sin We need to be mortifying the sin. How do we do that? I said we was going to come back to that. <coughs> Look at four. Ephesians four twenty three. And be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. How do we do that? How do we, how do we renew in the, spirits, the spirit of our minds? We look to the cross. We look at what Jesus accomplished on the cross for us. Remember we were spiritually dead. Every one of us is believers. At one time we were spiritually dead. And we had to have a sacrifice. We had to have a perfect, sinless sacrifice go to the cross and die for us. We couldn't do it ourselves. We couldn't, we, we couldn't work. I can't work. I can't look at myself and say, how am I going to quit sin? Okay, let's see. I'm going to put down a list of the Ten Commandments. 
Because in one way or another, most of the sins out there, I think maybe all of them, fall under one of those sins. So I, I'm going to look at, I'm just going to list down the Ten Commandments, because I'm going to do it myself. I don't need God. I'm going to do it myself. Let's think about this for a second. Because I've tried this. I've tried this back in my old past. I tried to be good. And I'm going to look at it, and I'm going to go through the list every morning, and I'm going to count it down, and I'm going to say, and I'm going to go through it. I'm going to fail. I'm going to fall. Because I'm going to make it to the first one, and I'm going to fall. I'm not even going to make it to the, level, to the last one. Because we need to be loving God with all our hearts, minds, soul, and strength all the time. None of us can do that. We all fail right there. Not one man out there besides Jesus Christ, the God-man, has ever loved God the Father with all his mind, heart, soul, and strength. So we all fail. We all deserve hell. We all deserve death. So how do we mortify the sin? We look to the cross and we remember what our sacrifice did, what God in heaven did when he stepped off his throne and took on man, 100% God, 100% man, and went to the cross for us. Then what else do we do? We pray and 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 we pray. And we pray. Because if we're not fellowshipping with our God, what hope do we have? We need to be looking at the cross and we need to be praying. And we need to be praying together and we need to be praying to, alone. And we need to be, if we're married, we need to be praying with our spouse. And we need to be praying alone. And we need to be reading his word. We need to be studying out God's Word, and we need to be praying while we're studying out God's Word, because it's His Word. I can't claim to know what His Word says, but if I'm praying and asking God to show me what His Word says, then I can... So that's how we mortify sin. That's, that's a touch of how we mortify sin. And it takes our whole lives... Because we have that dead man, that old man, some people say, that follows us around of sin. And he's always trying to raise up his ugly head. He's always trying to pull us down. He's always trying to pull us backwards. And it's a fight. It's a fight. So if I couldn't raise my spiritual deadness by myself and do that that beginning of my walk with Jesus when I came to be saved, if I couldn't do that by myself, what do I think I'm going to do by myself every day against this battle of sin? I need God 100%. I've got to have Him with me from the start through the finish. And then one day, one day we will, as believers in Jesus Christ, face Jesus face to face. And then we don't have that fight anymore. Then the battle's over. The battle's already over. Jesus already won it. But we still have to fight that battle. With ourselves. With that flesh. With the enemy who's always trying to creep in. But when we see Jesus face to face, it's over. The battle's over. Because the Bible says we will become like Him. We will never sin again. We will be... We will look at life a whole different way. We won't, we'll be happy for each other. We won't be jealous. We won't be, it's, it's going to be a beautiful day. And, and if you don't know the Lord, if you don't have this relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're sitting here today and you're like, well, it kind of sounds good. No, it sounds great. Quit fighting it. Come to know the Lord. It's not between you and me and, and God. It's not between you and whoever and God. It's between you and God. And you can do it right now in your seat. You can cry out to Lord, the Lord in your heart and you can say, God, I'm a wretch. 
I see what you did for me on the cross. I see that you come from, from your throne, your glorious throne for me because you've loved me and you come to this earth and died for me. And as I said last week, get at the foot of the cross. Lay your burdens out. And receive his forgiveness and his love. Because he'll trade him straight across. That's why he did it. That's why he came to save us. So right now, in your seat, if you don't know the Lord, cry out to him in your heart. And then fight the fight. Fight the good fight. Fight the sin. Fight against sin. Put it to death in your life. Do whatever you have to. Be like, be like Joseph when uh, <coughs> was it Potiphar's wife kept trying to seduce him. If you have to run, run. If you're home alone and you're a teenager and you're home alone and you're and you're sitting there and, and that computer's calling your name because you have an addiction with pornography, and then maybe you're not even a teenager, but anybody in this room, run from it if you have to. Go to a friend's house, get an accountability partner, do whatever you have to do because it's killing you spiritually inside of you. You won't lose your salvation if you're saved, but it's going to bring you down a road of hell. A life of hell. It'll split up marriages. It'll do. It'll cause so much damage in this world. And that's just one of many sins out there that we need to run from. But we can't do it on our own strength. I know. So we have to cry out to the Lord because it's this. That's the way God set it up. He wants our total obedience to Him. He wants our total trust to Him. So if we are struggling with something, cry out to the Lord and run. Cry out to the Lord and call a friend. Cry out to the Lord and do whatever you have to do. But we need to be mortified in the sin because it's, it's what God wants. It's what, he wants our total obedience to Him. He wants us to, not that we can do that, because we have that dead man that we're dragging around with us. But he wants a relationship with us. He wants us to have that relationship of love. Because he's already put his love out. He's already put it out. He did that when he came to the cross. The Father has already put his love out. When he was sitting there, when Jesus was sitting there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's crying out to the Lord, God, Take this cup away from me if you can. But not my will, but yours. Three times he did it, does this. But God's up there because in Isaiah 53 it says, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. And, and you know that the Father was in anguish too. But he had love for us. His creation. So he had to crush his own son. And Jesus has love for us. So they've already poured out their love towards us. And now we need to love him back by accepting him, by loving him, by not living in our old lives. I know, I know it's hard. There's so many times I want to go back to my old life. It, it, not, not, not that I'm good and going to do that, but I have times, temptations, when I get around some of my old friends that I'm like, man, I just want to go out, I want to hang out, do this stuff, party it up, whatever. No. We can't do that. That's not what the Lord wants us to do. So we need to... We just need to be mortified in our sin. And we need to do that by looking at the cross. Anyways, I'm done. And I'm going to pray for us. And, and we'll sing another song and we'll worship our Lord. Father, help us. Help us to mortify our sins. Help us to put them to death. Help them. Help us to do whatever we have to. Help us to focus on Jesus. Help us to focus on the cross and what He did for us. Help us, Lord. We need you. We need you. Every one of us needs you. We need your Spirit working mightily in us. We want to worship you. We want to sing your praises. We want to. 
We want to love you because you saved us, because you loved us first. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God in heaven. We say this in your name.